Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to Reinvention Works, Conversations from the Front Porch. I'm your host, Hollis Thomases, and with me this evening, I have my guest, Steve DiFilippo. Steve, why don't you say hi and a few words to the audience so the camera can see you. Hello, everybody. That was, um, that was very pithy. Nice to join. <laughs> so, um, just so everybody has a lay of the land, Reinvention Works is the destination for all things reinvention. We want to empower people and businesses to take control of their next future by using tools, networking, and education. And this webcast, Conversation from the Front Porch, is to do just that. We hope to, through these conversations, instruct, inspire, and motivate you to get going on that reinvention journey. Um, this evening's flow is going to be as follows. Our conversation with Steve, he and I are going to speak for about 30 minutes, and then we can open the floor up for Q&A, live Q&A, and we'll be done with everything by 9.10 at the latest, 9.10 Eastern Time. So we're going to start by getting comfortable, because we're supposed to be in our front porch. My front porch is a little dark right now. It's 8.30 at night. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to my beverage of the evening, I am in honor of rescheduling with Steve, having one of my most favorite wine bridles, Chateau Neuf de Pâques. This one is Domaine Charvin. Um, Chateau Neuf de Pâques can be a pretty pricey wine, but we happened to secure this on lastbottle.com. So it was less expensive, probably in the mid-20s range. Um, what I love about Chateau Neuf de Pâques is it is a real yummy, fruity, um, blend it's a grenache blend grenache syrah and mavedra usually usually and um this one has a little bit of a flowery taste to the palate but usually you get a lot of big berry flavors on the nose and it's got a nice long finish um this is a 2011 steve what are you drinking this evening uh well what i'm drinking is i if i drank wine i would fall asleep halfway through this this um uh, session so i've chosen to move to something a little more serious it, uh, I'm trying to do this without the reflection. It's by Petron, the famous tequila maker, and it's called Exo Cafe Dark, and it is a blend of coffee liqueur and um, blue agave, so it's basically like drinking jet fuel. Well, let's do a toast. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> so I have to say, Steve is uh, quite the gentleman to have been patient through my last crisis of the power outage. And um, I had already planned on having one of my favorite wines in his honor. But then I had another power outage. <laughs> yes, folks, my power came on at 7.53. Um, phew, I did have a backup plan. There's a weird uh, grid around here. And uh, three, do three doors down, they had power. So my neighbors were going to graciously open their doors for me. Um, so now that we're all comfortable and you know what we're, our dealio is, I just want to tell you that uh, when we're ready for Q&A, we will tell you, so please hold your questions until then, and you can find the Q&A icon in probably either the upper right or upper uh, left-hand corner of your screen. Just move your mouse along the edge of the perimeter of the window. Uh, it depends on what platform you're using, what device you're using. So. Let's get, uh, let's get everything else started. So Steve, what I'm going to do is ask you to give your uh, reinvention story, the, you know, sort of the uh, cliff notes, but the full version from when you were a young man till now in five minutes or less, and I will be uh, timing you. I'll give you the, uh, you'll pull yourself off the stage if you're going long. So let me turn the stage over to you. Great. Thanks. So my story began on a dark and stormy night. Um, <laughs> Actually, when I was uh, very young, a, a, a toddlerish age, um, my father, whenever someone would, something would break in our house, we would take it apart. So um, whether it was a fan, vacuum sweeper, a lawnmower, whatever the case, a toaster, um, we would sit down and we would take it apart, break, break apart all the pieces, and never to put it back together again, and never with an attempt to fix it, but just the attempt of understanding how all the parts work together. What was the integration? Where did the wires go? What were the gears? You know, how did the gears work and the electric motors? So I became very comfortable with technology. So as I start to tell the story about my multiple careers, um, there's a common thread of technology that sort of 
that created the path for my decision making and the opportunities that I pursued through the through the process. So to jump ahead to the age of fifteen, um, I had become very interested in in drumming and playing drums. So I was able to become a classically trained percussionist through the years and studying with some very very well known percussionists in the Delaware Valley in Philadelphia. The Philadelphia Orchestra was so well known at the time. Um, so, I, you know, I, I acquired that skill set. Um, then went on to, uh, you know, sort of a career in playing music and, and being a professional touring musician, but spent a lot of time in recording studios. And it was there that I really started to really develop the sense of technology. So after, during breaks in the recording, we, uh, we would move off to go socialize, but I would go into the control room and I wanted to learn what all those knobs and things did and the doodahs. And I learned to start to, to wire and patch this, the different uh, audio components together. Um, so my musical career kind of ended around the age of 30, 31. Um, and that was a choice of mine. It wasn't imposed upon me. I, my son was born and one night I realized that it was more fun to play with him than it was to put him down and then go play Disco Inferno for the thousandth time. So um, I decided to change my career path. That was the first sort of reinvention of myself. So what should I do? Um, so I had been dabbling during the day, got to know a lot of people because I was playing with all of the technologies um, and then moved sort of sideways into the creative services world, photography, filmmaking, television production. Um, and it was around this time that the, the analog age was moving into the digital age. So we started to see Macintosh computers starting to show up on the scene and, and instead of audio tape, we were moving to, to disc drives in the recording studio. So I, I moved into the, the creative services field and did that for a while, moved that into corporate America um, and did it at Campbell Soup and worked uh, after Campbell Soup for a number of other big Fortune 500 type companies. And then quickly transitioned from that when I got a little um, sort of um, unenamored with corporate America and some of the shenanigans that go on there decided, well, where do I want to go now? I'm, I'm kind of done with this corporate world, with creative services, uh, video, and you know, producing and directing and things. So I saw an opportunity in higher education, that education was in dire need of people who understood technologies um, to, to help them use technology better on campuses. So I was fortunate enough to secure a position with a small community college in New Jersey, and I, over the last 15 years, have advanced that up to now where I'm working in one of the top 10 engineering colleges and universities in the country um, as their CIO. So my career path has been you know, multiple careers. Um, to be quite honest, I'm looking to reinvent myself again. Um, I'm at an age now where I'm looking out, projecting out two or three years from now to say, well, what do I want to do as I move into sort of retirement years? Um, I don't want to retire, retire, but I want to keep busy. So. Um, I'm looking at some other opportunities to change careers one more time. So um, thank you. That, that was a very nice and streamlined edition. Of, what's that? Is that five minutes? That was less than five minutes. It was That's four right. minutes. I'm used to uh, <laughs> but um, I know your background a little bit uh, because you and I have spoken and in, in preparation for this. And so I want to circle back to a couple of things. Um, the first thing is that uh, though you were a professional musician, you went to college. Correct. And so you were playing, you know, around your studies, but you didn't do the 10 year plan. Correct. So when you gave up your career in, in, as a musician at age 30, when did you go back to get your master's? Uh, great question, actually. So when I decided I wanted to be a musician, and that was the only vision I had for myself, to be honest, um, I actually, you know, in the rock and roll era of the 70s, and, and uh, um, there was a notion in my head that I was never going to live past 40. So, you know, my career, <laughs> my vision of my future. I think we're both dead. <laughs> no, retirement. no, not that I was going to be dead. I just didn't, couldn't see myself living past 40 because musicians really, other than like the Rolling Stones and Paul McCartney and a few very select um, musicians who become famous, rarely do you see musicians at past the age of 40 doing well. So um, anyway, so I decided I was going to go to college and I was going to go to college and get a degree in, in music education so that when I reached a certain age, I could transition from a performing musician into a teach and teaching musician and work at a high school or college and teach. Um, the interesting part was when I was a freshman at college, I was informed by the dean of the music department that I was enrolled in 
that I would never be able to be successful as a musical student because I was tone deaf. And, and he was able to demonstrate to me that I was legitimately tone deaf. So I can hear when something like a guitar or piano, a timpani drum is out of tune. I just can't get it back in tune. So I didn't know what to do. My, my life was like literally shattered when I realized I couldn't be a musician. Then I really quickly realized that there were other things to do. And I got a degree in mass communications uh, from Rowan University and became really enamored with that and found it to be really, really interesting. So I was playing music six and seven nights a week. Um, to be honest, mass communications isn't a rigorous you know, sort of degree program. Um, so I was able to pull that off. And then I went right to New York University to get my master's degree right after I got my undergraduate degree. So within a five year span, I had my master's degree and was sort of trolling the world from that point on. So getting exposure to New York City was a lot of fun. Uh, got to see a great number of bands and played up in that area for a while. So that's where my education came from. Gotcha. And again, with mass communication, a lot of technology, radio, television, film, right, and beyond. And actually, my master's thesis was in the world of holography, three-dimensional imaging, which we're now starting to see come into reality 40 years later. Right, right. So it wasn't like you decided, well, I, I want to leave this career, and now I need to get additional education. Correct. It was It was more a matter of leveraging an education that you had gotten that you really weren't necessarily using initially. Right. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And, um, and then when you talk about that you transitioned uh, into communications and creative services, um, you know, there, what did you have to learn and teach yourself or um, provide to your, yourself that you didn't already have the skills for? Because, yeah, you studied it in school but there's the difference between study and real world application and then did anybody take you seriously coming off of basically a career as a studio musician yeah <laughs> all of the above <laughs> so while i was playing music i was dabbling in creative services so i you know studied photography and filmmaking so i was helping other people make movies during the day and films in the area and i was always had a camera in my hand taking photographs and had won a couple of awards from Kodak, interestingly enough, while I was still playing music at night. So, so as a professional musician, that was my primary source of income and my primary career, but I was always dabbling. I always have a lot of coals in the fire. There's, there's rarely a time in my life when I haven't been playing with other things around the edges of what I'm doing. So even to this day, I'm, I'm a keynote speaker at, seminars and conferences on technology and education. I do a little bit of consulting on the side. I do social media work for a pharmaceutical firm. So I've always got something else going on. Um, so I'm teaching myself skills all through this process. Um, so for Huffington Post, as an example, to, to whatever degree Huffington Post has validity, um, one of their authors has me listed as one of the top 100 social CIOs in the country. Well, how did I become that? You just learn how to be social and social networks and social media. So you just get good at it and have communication skills and communication theory background. You learn how that works. So while I was working six and seven nights in clubs and, and, and with bands, um, you know, I was messing around during the day. So I had some skills. But the interesting part of doing this sort of reinvention is you're a salesperson. And you, you, you know, I knew a long time before we labeled ourselves as brands that I was a brand and that I had to sell myself ahead of the skills. So it's always networking. So when I would be walking around the recording studio, meeting producers, meeting executives from other organizations and other businesses and and getting to know a lot of the engineers and the people in the music business who then moved on to other things. And it's just that networking part really worked. So um, that's what really got me my first job outside of music was the, was the combination of networking sales and understanding how to brand myself. And basically, for lack of a better term, BS your way into a job. <laughs> so, so, I believe you, huh? <laughs> so when I talk about reinvention and, 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 and career shifting, 
So it wasn't changing jobs. It's literally changing whole careers like many of your other guests have, done, have talked about. I think there's three aspects of that. There's motivation. Are you motivated to do something? Do you have the aptitude? And then do you have the opportunity? So I think I've always felt very strongly and very comfortable and confident that I have the motivation. I have the aptitude. So now where are the opportunities coming from? And that's, I think you make your own opportunities. So I've always done that. Right. And actually that was something that I did want to circle back to as well, which is the notion of um, more, more than once when you were giving your, your background, it was an unstated kind of thing that you saw opportunity. And it seems like uh, in your case, you are not only seeing opportunity in front of you and sort of looking into the future so you can make opportunity happen for you. Uh, so it's not even, you know, to your three things point, I think it's not even just a matter of the single word opportunity. I think what you are doing is always looking down the road at how can I create my next opportunity? So not waiting for opportunity to present itself, not waiting for opportunity to knock, but more so positioning yourself for that opportunity. Yeah, there, and actually I think it's a little bit of both. Um, my father actually used to say this to me. So you don't ever want to be out back taking out the garbage when opportunity's knocking at the front door. So it's being aware of opportunity. And then the other part of it is, is making your own opportunities and trying to structure things. So for example, uh, we all know what Google Glass is, presumably. So no, I was- Don't assume that everybody knows what that okay. is. Google Glass, go Google it, <laughs> is um, eyewear that allows you to record. And it has a recording device built into it. So it's kind of goofy looking a little bit, a little cyborg-ish, but um, I was one of the early adopters and one of the early people to, to take advantage of that. Um, it never really panned out, but that was, um, I wouldn't say it was a lost opportunity, but you, you know, I saw that coming and I said, let me jump on board. That seems like it's a pretty interesting possibility. So I'm always looking for those kinds of opportunities. Um, there was an interesting, I think it was a French sociologist that I read long, long time, decades ago. And I think it's called the book of luck. I think that's the title, but the notion was she studied the concept of luck and I believe it was a female. Um, that's how long ago it was. I just can't remember the details. But it, the concept was that after she done, had done her research, it became very apparent that there is no such thing as luck. The people who believed they were truly lucky were the people who, took it, who were able to recognize opportunity and then act on that opportunity. The people who felt they were unlucky were people who couldn't recognize opportunity. And when they did recognize opportunity, didn't know how to act on it. I think that's a real critical component to reinventing yourself is that you have to be able to recognize opportunity or make opportunity for yourself and then act on it. And the act part is where I think a lot of people trip and fall. So what's the process look like? What's the, how do you get over the fear factor? How do you overcome your own insecurities? And we all have them. Um, and to move forward and act on that opportunity and take advantage of it. And I'm fairly fearless. So today, after 60 some odd years of living in the Delaware Valley, I'm now living in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't afraid to take that leap and make that move. You know? and, and I think for some people, after 60 years of being, you get complacent, you get far too complacent, and you say, oh, I'm not gonna take that. But I was looking for opportunities anywhere in the world, so yeah. Well, let's go back to that. You, know, you just kind of ticked off a few things that you feel that people, that hold people back. So let's revisit those and, and what, what is your advice to overcoming them? So what is, the, what is your advice to overcoming a fear? What is your advice for overcoming the lack of ability to see an opportunity? You know, what are those, uh, what, what, what would your advice be? A lot of people have said it in different ways. Um, I don't know how to help. I don't know how to tell somebody to overcome their fear. Other than, the, I mean, how do you tell somebody who has, you know, who's a, who has a fear of flying to overcome fear of flying? Um, I think that's an interesting challenge and I would love to dabble in that someday and so I would become a little bit of a career coach and help people understand how to get from point A to point B. Um, but I don't know that I can help you overcome your fear. I can help you find a path. And this is the interesting part. So we've heard a lot of people talk about, you know, follow your passion and the money will follow. I'm not so sure that always works to be honest, but um, because the, the implication there is that you'll become rich if you follow your passion. I think you can follow your passions, 
you just don't think, don't expect to get rich. Mm -hmm. You'll be comfortable, but you'll be happy. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was uh, Hunter, Hunter Thompson, the famous gonzo journalist, when he was 20 years old, 22 years old in 1958, was asked by his friend um, a very really complex question about what's, what's the meaning of life, essentially. And, and Thompson wrote a really interesting, a fairly lengthy response that you can Google on the internet and find. Um, but he basically said that you, you really don't want to find a goal, you want to understand the person. So as an individual, what is it that motivates me and what is it that what are my passions so then set your path around that and then your goals will become self-evident so i never set out to reinvent myself i just had this path of technology i love technology i happen to be good at it and understand it i'm not afraid of it um you know when i used to teach uh computers people were always afraid in the early days that they were going to break the computer and i used to tell them the only way you can break the computer is to throw it out the second story window so, you know, I have no fear of those kinds of things. So the technology was sort of the, the, the common thread, if you will. But my path was very varied, and, and it would, I went in a lot of different directions. Um, you know, so there was a lot of side careers that never really blossomed into what I would call a full career, but I was always dabbling in, in technologies and things. So the notion is, is that you want to seek to understand the man and not the path, not the goal. And if you do it that way, and that was in Hunter Thompson's letter, his response is that and it was really interesting. And I think it's worth reading for anybody who's contemplating reinventing themselves and trying to change their career, or change their, their orientation, is that, you know, look and understand how you work. It's really about sort of in a, in a Zen Buddhist kind of way is to really self-reflect and be very self-aware and say, OK, now where does what path presents itself to me? because I need to understand me first. And I think that's something I've always innately done. I didn't study it. I mean, I studied it later in life, but um, when I discovered there were certain sort of teachings and philosophies that matched how I've actually already lived my life. So I think that's, you know, I don't know how to tell people to not to not be afraid, but it, you, you lose your fear if you understand yourself and then you just let follow paths that make themselves evident. And Hunter Thompson refers to that as the ninth path. So if eight paths are presented to you that are determined by someone else, if you do this, if you go to college and take these courses, you will become such and such. That's a path that is presented to you that's imposed upon you. Um, if, if that's one of the eight paths. So if you find that none of those eight paths are fulfilling to you, the way to overcome the fear is to find the ninth path, which is, understand yourself what is your passion what drives you what motivates you why do you get out of bed every morning and then go find go follow that and the goals will present themselves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah because i i can't so Tarek and a little kind of you know zen like but hey that's who i am well it's not so much in the sense that uh another thing that i think um is is a recurring theme for you as you have already said is that you're drawn to the technology you're your dad was the impetus for lowering the barrier to fear of technology. So it's something that's always been uh, in your comfort zone. But what you did a little differently is that you didn't say, I love technology and therefore I am going to pursue, deliberately pursue um, a career in technology because you didn't do that. I mean, that's where you are now. Right. But interestingly, you, you know, you played the drums as a professional musician and then you went into creative services. And then, so it was almost as if that technology always had a presence in the studio. You had technology that was behind the scenes. When you were in creative services, you had technology that you had to rely upon to do the output, at, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Like in, in obviously in your career now, it's, it's the foundation. So, if I think about the fact that you've just said that you want to reinvent again, I can almost rest assured that somehow technology is going to rear its little head, but it's not going to be that you go looking, scratching your head going, you know, where is this next technology reinvention? It's almost like you're dialed into it and that's how you're drawn to it and it's drawn to you. So that goes back to your little Zen like, you know, description, which is, um if if in reality you end up wanting to do career coaching for somebody who um 
you know, is looking for their path and you don't know how to tell them to, to debunk their fear, you will probably end up co coaching people who are looking either to get in or out of technology. You know, that, that, that just seems like a natural path. <laughs> Well, what we would end up doing probably is using technology to help through the coaching process. Or that too. Right. Exactly. It'll be something. I think you have a good point that um, the technology is sort of ingrained in me. It's, it's, it's hardwired into my DNA somehow. Um, I see how things connect together that a lot of other people don't see. For example, I was playing drums and I was singing and, and helping to MC the night. And typical for the old days, there was like a boom microphone that hung out over my head. It was always getting away and it didn't work. Well, having dabbled during the daytime in, in television production and going to TV studios, they were the early days of clip-on microphones for the announcers, right? For the host, the uh, anchors. And I thought, well, I'm not really singing primary singer. I'm just doing backup and I'm doing a little bit of talking. Why don't I get one of those and put them on my, my clothing instead of having this big boom mic? Well, now every day, now all the singers have a little microphone that comes around. So it's somehow way ahead of the curve, I had, I had seen a technology over here and a need over here, married them together. And if you really, at the end of the day, when somebody says to me, um, you know, they say, what's your elevator speech? And I just tell them, I connect the dots between technology and what people need. So it's this integration of seeing what's possible and then seeing a, a gap and then marrying the two together and figuring out how to make it work. But, but to bring that um, back around to something, you know, kind of relevant to a, a other context, um, the guest that I interviewed last night went from being a fashion photographer to a gluten-free bake, right. fresh baker. And her, what, what her, marriage was is that she had a disease she discovered eating better led to feeling better wouldn't other people like to feel better and also have yummy delicious fresh baked goods there must be a need in the market i'm going to marry those two together so you know sometimes it's just that recognition of i have i have something to to bring forward and there is obviously a need here you like so it's not just about recognizing opportunity, it's also about recognizing the need. Well, yeah, and I think need and opportunity are almost synonymous. So in the case of the microphone thing, I saw an opportunity to bring something I knew about that no one else had thought about, bring it together. Where I didn't extend it was, well, what happens if we take it to the next step? I shut, uh, you know, my, the, I, I closed the door of opportunity to say, well, why can't we do that with singers and put a microphone next to their mouth, right? As opposed to clipping it on their clothing. So, and that's like a huge industry in and of itself or putting, you know, I used to have these monstrous speakers next to my ear, which is why I'm half deaf today. And now everybody's putting, you know, earbuds in their ears and their monitors are in their ears. So, you know, I, there's opportunity and then there's opportunity. So I'm just going to like throw my two cents in if you don't mind. Yeah. I think there is a slight distinction between need and opportunity. Opportunity is, um, like to me is something where there is the potential but more than not it's already self-evident you know the the marketplace has raised their hand and therefore that's opportunity whereas i think need is more early stage and it tends to come from somebody's recognition that there's a gap and that gap could be filled and then if that person wants to do the filling of the gap. They are trying to create opportunity by filling a need. I can so, that. So, so I just, I just um, personally feel that there's a slight distinction. And when you're, um, I, I would also kind of ask how you have coped being so early to market with what you've identified as opportunities when it's really sometimes in advance of the need. Yeah. That's the challenge for a lot of people is, is being too far ahead of the curve. And in the world of technology, what we're seeing a lot of things happening is things like MySpace. MySpace probably died because broadband wasn't, wasn't available. So there was a gap in the technology. Sometimes there's a gap in socioeconomic conditions or, or sort of uh, social uh, acceptance of things like Google Glass took a big hit because it looks so weird and people were afraid of being recorded when they didn't know they were being recorded. And right. so well, we were in the age of mobile for 10 years. Yeah. Right. 
So I have adopted this phrase, um, at least in my industry in education right now, it's called wait two years. So I will come forward with a notion and then two years from now, some, it'll start to reach some level of tipping point. Right. It's, it's, it is frustrating to really be able to have the vision of what could possibly be, but the, some of the challenge and the trick is, is to be able to be patient, understand timing and understand the whole ecosystem. So it's not just about a technology or the technologies or the context. It's, it's, well, it really is about the context and how does, what are all of the components? So if you take the concept of, you know, ecology as, as sort of practiced by biologists and, and um, ecologists, you know, what is it about a pond that makes a pond thrive? What is it about a forest that makes the forest thrive? Well, it's not just having big trees in the forest, but it's all of the things that go with it. It's, even down to the tiniest microscopic bugs that live on the leaves that, you know, eat the moss off the leaves or whatever. I don't know. So when you're talking about, you know, opportunity, there's an ecosystem at play that you have to be able to understand when the right time is to either introduce an idea or bring it forward and accelerate it. Right. Um, and I, that's the fun part of watching the startup community because it's so, so lush right now and i've been very involved when i was in philadelphia in the ed tech startup community and up in new york with the the tech startup community in general and just seeing all these great ideas and then stepping back and trying to work with the the, uh, the leaders of these companies and saying whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute you need to slow down a little bit um or you need to press the you need to stand on the gas now and go get your funding because you're going to miss the boat right. there's so many other complexities at play than just the idea or just the opportunity I'm so glad that you elaborated on on what it means to have that ecosystem because if you had just dropped the word and not elaborated with your pond analogy, I think I probably would have made you do something to help the audience understand. Well, here, so here's the interesting part. My master's degree is in a topic called media ecology, and it's really the study of mass media as an ecosystem. So people were studying television and like, you know, noise and communication patterns and all kinds of crazy stuff in isolation. And you just can't do that. Right. So, um, so Neil Postman started this, this stuff, this discipline called media ecology. You can look it up, do a Google search on it because it's a pretty fascinating concept. Um, and, and it really does. I've been able to carry that over into my world of technology. Great. Well, I, believe it or not, we are already at four minutes over. So I'm going to uh, cut us off now and open the floor for some Q&A. And, um, and then I have one or two questions in the holding tank, if we will. So uh, let's get to the questions. First question is, what would you use to understand yourself that you can so that you can find your path? Wow, that's the question <laughs> of eternity. <laughs> it, it's, I, I don't even know where to start to answer that, but I would start by reading and I, I would start by finding books that are probably in the category of self-help and just start to read them and you'll, things will start to resonate with you that say, oh yeah, I like that idea. And then you can start to reflect a little bit. But it's also being very conscious of your own behavior. When are you angry? Why are you angry? When are you happy? Why are you happy? So instead of just putting labels on things at the moment, understand the underlying sort of where this comes from. So for some people, it's years and decades of therapy with a ther psychotherapist or a counselor. For some people, it's just having an innate ability to observe your own behavior. Um, so there's a friend of mine who is a professional clown and he uses this phrase that I am just a clown watching you watch me watch you walk by. And I think that's an interesting notion. So that's very observant. You just have to. So here where I got a lot of this from was being so many years on a stage playing the same songs over and over again. It becomes rote memory. So I would start to watch human behavior. So my reality TV show back in the 70s was all the people, the people drinking at the bar, the people trying to connect with each other out on the dance floor or whatever, and you just learn human behavior and then you start to self-reflect. I think that's a, it's an interesting question. It's a different answer for everybody, but I would start by reading and I would start by really taking moments to med, you know, however you want to call it, meditating, but self-reflecting, look in the mirror, literally look in the mirror and, and, and identify who's looking back at you. And wh why do you get up in the morning? What's really driving you? 
Um, and are you doing things that are, that are fulfilling to you in some way? And you'll learn more about yourself. And trust me, it doesn't happen when you're 20 or 30 or 40. It happens when you're older. It all starts to sort of congeal or congeal and really come together. Okay, great. Let me see if there's any other questions. Okay, no more questions. So I have a final question for you. It's actually uh, a multi-part question in that if you were to advise our audience on three things that they could put into play right now to help them either get on a reinvention path or move further along in their reinvention path besides read, what would you say? I think it's the answer to that question, the previous question is really get to know yourself. So if we go back to the Hunter Thompson uh, response to his friend is, you know, understand the man and then the path will become self-evident. Don't, don't identify a goal. So don't wake up in the morning and say, I want to become a hedge fund, you know, broker and, and go do that and be miserable and end up like the guy in Philadelphia who opened Rose's Pizza and they're now, you know, paying forward. You, yeah. So you can Google that one too. <laughs> So okay, I mean, that's four Google references, and Google's not paying us. <laughs> so um, I, I got to cut you off with the Google thing. <laughs> there's, there's, there's the second one, because I'm going to go to number five. And it's just <laughs> all Google stuff. You know? <laughs> like, what, what interests you when you walk around them during the day? You go down the street and go, boy, I think that would be an interesting thing to do. Well, go find out how that happens. <laughs> what does it take to do that? You know, and Google is where you start. And, and Wikipedia is not a bad thing either. So... Uh, <laughs> Actually, you made me just think of something, but I want to let you finish. Go ahead. Well, go ahead, because I don't have a third one. <laughs> well, um, speaking about being reflective and observant and, and Googling or not Googling, um, you know, I had the idea for Reinvention Works when I was forced to leave behind all of my electronic devices. Uh, I was in jury duty, and I literally just had a pad of paper. And so sometimes when you're doing that reflection, I don't think it's a bad thing to, you know, remove yourself from the, the typical world that we live in today. And, and that's the ninth path, actually, for, for, from what McLuhan references. And, and that is to, to step sideways, find the path less taken, you know, all those great cliches. But the, the reality is do something. Oh, here's the third thing. Do something that makes you feel incredibly uncomfortable. Do uh -huh. something scares the living daylights out of you. And I don't mean like hold a spider in your hand, like go, go do a tandem parachute jump or do, go take up snorkeling, something that's just crazy. You know, if you've never been on a roller coaster, go get on a roller coaster, do something that's going to potentially scare you, but change, change the channel, change the channel, go find something different, go take a walk in the park, go take your shoes off. I just remember the great scene from the, um, um, what was the movie that Richard Gere was in? Um, Officer and Gentleman? No, uh, no. Um, something Woman. Wow, wait. Pretty back. Woman? Yeah, Pretty Woman. So here's this highfalutin ty tycoon who never took his shoes off and walked barefoot in the park until she forced him to do that and changed his whole disposition. I understand that's a cliche, but you know, do something different. Just try something different, and it will. Like you did with your with with the jury duty, you were forced to try something different, and it changed your perspective. And here you are starting a whole new business, and you're being successful at it. That's awesome. Right, and there you have your answer to how do you teach someone to to uh, kind of stare down their fear, which is to confront it head on with something. It doesn't have to be your big, huge, hairy fear. It could just be one fear. Right. So Steve, we got to wrap up now. Um, I'm so grateful for your time and your patience again. Thank you for bearing with the uh, power outage the other day. Folks, I'm going to show you um, what's coming up on Reinvention Works. We have next episode is going to be, well, it's not going to be Steve DiFilippo and, or Paul Cashman. It's going to be Germina Gonzalez and Germina uh, was it is a Mexican native. Um, she is a very well educated, was a high powered corporate executive with companies like Exxon. Um, she was flying back from a meeting and she met a gentleman on the airplane who happened to be an American but of Spanish speaking parents 
they started speaking and having a conversation. The next thing she knew, she was moving to the United States and marrying this man and having to not only reinvent her entire life because uh, she was leaving her job and leaving behind her family, but uh, she didn't know what the next step of her career would be. So uh, speak of a fearless woman, a dynamic woman. Uh, Germina is a lot of fun. You will really enjoy her. And she has that accent. So if you like listening to the accent, Germina will be great to um, enjoy. And I would encourage you, if you are interested in listening to other issues, other episodes of Reinvention Works Conversation from the Front Porch, just go to Reinvention Conversations from the Front Porch slash uh, Reinvention Works slash webcasts, reinventionworks.com slash webcasts. And um, please tell your friends, anybody that you know that might be interested in reinventing. It's usually Wednesday nights at 8.30 p.m. Tonight was an exception because we were rescheduling Steve. And if you are on social media, our hashtag is pound reinvention works. So we really appreciate everything. And Steve, I'm going to bring you back on just to wave goodbye. Steve, thank you so much. Yes, I, I have, I, I've drained my glass dry. So thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.